All right, okay, let's get started, everybody. Thanks for your patience. Um, I'm gonna turn my camera on just for a second to say hello, uh, but in the interest of keeping the Zoom webinar uh, not from lagging too much, I'm gonna turn my video off and then I'll say goodbye again at the end. Uh, we've got about an hour, less than an hour now together, so we're gonna go through some fun tips and tricks and then, um, yeah, we'll get started. As I mentioned, I've got Francesca, uh, who leads our customer success efforts here at BioRender on the line, as well as Brigitte, who heads up our community here at BioRender. So they're here to answer any questions you might have. Feel free to ask them in the chat box. I believe it's getting a little flooded, so you're ha uh, welcome to use the Q&A section of the Zoom uh, app to do so, to ask any questions. Okay. So I'm gonna turn off my video for now. So I will see you at the end of this talk, but you'll hopefully still hear my voice uh, throughout the next hour. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And um, let's see here, hopefully. Okay, and then all I have to do Let's hit share. Bear with me here. All right. So hopefully you can see my screen. It should just be the BioRender Learning Hub top five design tips for better slide decks. Okay. Scan my screen here. Okay, and um, as I mentioned, please feel free to ask questions in the chat box if you do have any or in the Q&A. And um, all right, I'm going to get started. And Brigitte, Francesca, maybe you can just let me know if you can see my window and hopefully not my notes because they're very messy. All good. Okay. Great, all right, I'm gonna go into full screen mode then. All right, so welcome everybody. Um, this is sort of our first openly free and uh, interactive design webinar that we're running with BioRender. This is something that we've put together based on very popular demand. Um, and someone has asked if the slides will be available that we're presenting. We're actually going to, hopefully, if we can get it compressed and online, we're gonna be posting it. Uh, for a later viewing and you can kind of watch through the deck later on. Um, it might take a little bit of compressing though, so um, won't guarantee they'll get done this week, but hopefully next week. Uh, and, you know, since we're all working from home, I thought, you know, why not take this opportunity to brush up on our design skills um, as it pertains to better science communication. And I guess if this gets washed at a later date, today is April 2nd. We're kind of right in the thick of the COVID-19 outbreak, uh, which is why we're all kind of hunkered down and doing the best we can to stay safe and also trying to stay productive uh, while working from home. So I went to the registration list with my team this morning. It actually broke our Zoom account and we had to upgrade from the 500 attendee to 3000. So I'm really excited that you're all as eager as we are about improving you know, science communication uh, and now we're all part of a community that really deeply cares about, you know, becoming better visual storytellers. Uh, and yes, we will email you once we get that video live, so you won't have to look out for it. That being said, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel, which will probably also be where they'll be housed. Okay, so we've kind of distilled it down to five design tips, um, and it will be focused on slide deck design in particular. But you'll see that some of the things we talk about now will apply to other purposes like journal figures, grant images, posters. Um, and then that being said, we will be running weekly webinars to cover these topics in more detail. Um, and then again, we're going to post those links to sign up for those next webinars uh, in the chat box later. Okay, so really quick, quick background. Uh, we'll go through about BioRender and you know why we're here. And then we'll dive right into five easy to use tips for slide decks. And I'm gonna cover both how to make better figures. Um, again, we only have an hour together or less now, so um, it'll just be kind of you know at the surface, but at least hopefully you'll, you'll walk away with some actionable tips. 
as well as uh, you know how to design PowerPoint and Google slide decks in general. So not just the figures, but you know as a whole. And then if you've got time at the end, I'd love to switch gears and do a little bit of a figure makeover. Um, we've had some volunteers submit some of their figures ahead of time, so we can actually go through and uh, try to do a before and after figure together. And that's if you've got time. So hopefully we'll breeze through the next little bit here. A bit of background about myself. Um, I went through the grad graduate program at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. There's about five or six students a year that uh, matriculate from that graduate program. So pretty niche program. Um, and yeah, really enjoyed it. Recommended if you want to go into that field. Uh, following school, I went straight to National Geographic as my first job and then um, kind of led the science illustration arm there last several years and then most recently um, you know co-founded uh, BioRender with a few colleagues and then now we are a much bigger team than that and yeah I'm really excited to keep building products for all of you to help with your visual science communication uh, endeavors so this is a quick picture of myself I like to show it just because um, you know you might open a page of National Geographic and see the really glossy images designed um, in those centerfolds, but it really takes an army and really, really messy kind of, you know, research and uh, collaboration and sketches and multiple, multiple iterations to get there. In fact, even photographers, sometimes they come back with rolls of film and then they were sent back out into the field, you know, back on a plane, back onto the site to take, um, you know, a, another week or two of pictures because they didn't quite get that right one. So, I was lucky enough to be surrounded by a really high caliber team, but just wanted to say that the drawing and the visual communication process should be as messy as, you know, just the research process itself. It's not a, you know, get started and then finish beginning to end in um, 30 minutes. Sometimes it takes a little bit of planning and sketching out just as you would for your experiments. So here's an example of some of the figures you were able to make together at National Geographic. Um, I'm just showing you this because it kind of, you know, tells you a little bit about the, how much we've been thinking about better science communication in general and how to reach a broader audience. Um, you know, at a glance, you should be able to tell even the most complex story like this from a distance. So this image was actually a picture we put together to show how different parts of this building that Antony Gaudi had designed didn't get built and did get built. So the gray areas are actually the parts that he was a little too ambitious about and wasn't able to create in one go uh, while he was alive. And the colored areas are the areas that he was able to build. Um, I created most of the design here using Adobe Illustrator, many, many hours measuring by hand the perspective. Uh, you know, we won't obviously expect you or go through this kind of tutorial today, but just to show you that you know, even the most complex concepts can be distilled at a distance, kind of like an impressionist painting. You know, if you walk away 10 feet, you should be able to get the story across um, in, you know, within a few seconds. And just as a feather on our cap, we were able to obtain the sort of Oscar for infographics that year um, at a global competition. This is another type of figure that we usually uh, were, you know, able to collaborate on. So things like cross sections of animal species showing the internal anatomy. This was actually made with um, clay plasticine. And then we took a photo and then overlaid Photoshop layers on top of it. So you can really get creative with the type of media you use to visualize concepts. This is another figure we made to compare the human and dolphin brain and cortical regions and how the um, different regions are placed differently in different species depending on function. So that was a really fun piece to, that we were able to collaborate on. And uh, finally, you know, I was itching to sort of get back into the biomedical space. So did a lot of work like this. You've probably seen this on pharmaceutical websites, you know, um, on splash pages, and they really do serve a great purpose. Uh, but we noticed that, you know, over the years, Scientists really needed kind of a simple solution to describing complex concepts. And the types of you know, emails that I would get looked a little bit more like this. And um, this might hit a visceral chord with some of you as far as you know, the type of figures that you probably had to make. I'm sure many of you are much more design savvy than this, but you know, this is pretty typical. You know, maybe it's created in, in PowerPoint or Microsoft Paint. 
um, perhaps Illustrator if you're a little bit more savvy, but um, you know, you, you can see how it was pretty disheart disheartening when we would see figures like this and then, you know, it go to production or publication or even presented at uh, Nobel Prize winning speeches. So, you know, the kind of list goes on with the types of figures that look a little bit disjointed, try to describe almost the same thing. And so, you know, we realized what scientists probably just needed um, and students were, you know, a simple solution just to create, you know, schematic pathways and, uh, you know, really communicate a lot of information on one slide. Um, and that's why we built BioRender. So our goal is to give every scientist the tools and the practical knowledge to visually communicate their research. So today is going to be, you know, a lot about that practical knowledge component uh, and really pairing that with the tools. Great. And so, of course, BioRender itself is an online program for creating high quality images designed for researchers and their teams. So even if you're not a researcher, perhaps you're, you know, a lab manager or a designer, um, you know, basically, even if you have no art background and probably no time, uh, BioRender is a great solution for you. And this is a quick snapshot of BioRender in play. Sorry, it's a little bit blurry here. I think my video is compressed a little too much. Um, Common use cases are, of course, for publications, presentations, which we are going to cover today, lab meetings, grant applications, research proposals, and the list goes on. So these are really just examples of where you can spruce up your communication using figures. And hopefully, um, you know, we'll go through that. Thank you so much. I'm seeing some comments here saying that BioRender has been a great tool for you. So I'm glad there's some people on the call here that have used BioRender already. Um, Here's what kind of makes us the happiest, really, when we see figures like this that were made in, you know, PowerPoint and took hours and probably days to make. And, you know, not entirely terrible. It's actually um, got a lot of good information there. But, you know, if you can take that and then, you know, kind of communicate that in a little bit more of a schematic and, and standardized way, uh, much, much faster, you know, all the better if you can save time and um, boost the aesthetic quality. This was an example of a cover piece that we did uh, last year, and it made the cover, which was great, and um, kind of took a what could have been a sad story into a happy story. So um, yeah, very proud of our team on this piece here. And then of course, a couple of quotes here from happy buyer renderers. Um, and you know, you guys are all really what makes us get up in the morning and do what we do and, and love what we do, so. Definitely encourage you to try out the app if you haven't already. So that was a really quick kind of intro into kind of our background and why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and now I'd love to sort of dive into the five tips. Again, you don't have to write anything down. You're welcome to if you'd like. We are going to um, likely post this video online so you can watch it at a later time. But definitely feel free to let the questions flow in if you have any. Great, okay, so tip number one. Um, this might sound familiar already, and it's the kind of concept of using uh, breadcrumbs and padding to really lead your audience through the story. So, um, you know, what that means is basically, you know, you have to treat your entire slide deck like one cohesive story, all the way from the title slide down to the thank you page. So you almost have to really kind of, you know, beat, beat them over the head with what part of your presentation that you're actually talking about. Um, this is a very generalized flow for a good PowerPoint slash keynote story. So this is, you know, take this as a simple guide. It's not sort of a one size fits all, but you know, fit it to your own story or needs. Basically, you want to show the title, you know, how to get in, sort of how to get in touch with you with follow-up questions, all of that in the first page. And then clearly state your outline of the talk. Um, don't be afraid to also use up an entire slide to reiterate the topic that you're talking about. So it's almost like a board game. You want to be able to walk your uh, audience through the entire storyline um, from, for example, topic one, topic two, topic three, and then, you know, literally repeat that topic in the subheader of each slide. So um, this is, you know, again, really helpful. Chances are we're all working from home right now. So people are naturally going to be a little bit more distracted working from home. They're probably gonna be on Instagram or Twitter and then kind of toggle back to your presentation when you say something exciting or 
something that you think you have to remember for later. So, um, you know, that's going to really help reorient your audience if you've got sort of the subheading on that slide itself. So again, this is just a kind of a template. Um, another thing about padding and breadcrumbs is, um, you know, padding is your friend. So you'll probably, if you were to walk into a design studio with professional designers, you'll see mostly computer screens covered with these sort of fuchsia grid lines. Um, and that's because even as professionals, we actually don't trust our own eyes. For presentations, for example, you especially want everything to be within a good one centimeter to one inch from the edges of the slide. Otherwise, it gets really uncomfortable for the viewer. So, um, for example, I'm going to go use my uh, sort of summary or intro slide here. And what I did was I put these grid lines around where I thought, you know, I should stay within. So make sure your pictures and your words don't really bleed into those areas around the margins. Um, and then if you have a logo or maybe a page watermark or something that can go within the margin lines, but really you want to center your content in the middle. And I don't know why it is, but it's just a lot more easy on the eyes. So really hold true to that. That's probably the first thing I do when I go up and clean up someone's slide deck that they want me to revamp for them. I just kind of go in and add a bunch of padding everywhere, take out content. Um, really uh, the space, it might feel like a waste of space, but really it is necessary for the eye to feel comfortable. So it, this you know, seems easy in practice, but if you remember this, I, I promise your slide decks will look much, much cleaner going forward. So that was tip number one. Again, try to use breadcrumbs and you know, storylines wherever you can, and um, make sure to use plenty of padding along the edges. Um, I'm just gonna pause for a real quick second here and see if you've got any questions that haven't been answered yet. Looks like a lot of them are being kept up with Brigitte and Francesca. And if you're just joining now, I do have two colleagues on the line, Francesca and Brigitte, who are able to answer questions if you have them. Um, and then at the end, if they weren't answered or couldn't be answered, I'll be happy to address them. Okay, so of the five tips, we are now on number two. And um, hopefully we'll breeze through this quick enough that we can do a bit of a demo at the end here. So tip number two, be memorable with relatable images. Um, basically, that means try to use more analogies and puns. I'm sure as scientists, we all using puns and analogies and you know, it makes it easy with all those fancy memes and GIFs flying around. Um, I would use those sparingly, but definitely try to use relatable images. And um, here's an example of what I mean. So I love talking about pictorial languages. Um, I like using, I guess, Japanese as an example just because I that's, that's my background. And um, so Japanese, Chinese, quite similar in reading and writing. And, you know, Japanese is inherently a pictorial or logographic language. Um, but if I were to tell you in words or describe it to you in a paragraph like this, it's not very impactful. In fact, way too many words for a slide, um, you know, even if it is right now face to face in a way on a computer screen, you're probably trying to read this as you're listening to my voice and it's just way too distracting. So obviously, you know, slim down the content to pictures. This is really cool. If you didn't know already, if you don't speak uh, either Japanese or Chinese, you maybe didn't know this, but the word for river is just these three lines that look like a river. I thought that was really cool. Um, and then growing up, it was really easy to learn words like tree, woods, and forest, because it's literally one tree, two tree, three trees. Um, so really cool. Um, still took me a minute to kind of explain this to you, but you know, obviously using you know, less words is much more impactful. Um, but let's try with a photo. So now that I've put this picture up, I probably got the attention of most of you on the call. Um, and, you know, if I were to show you that the character for literally food on a skewer, which is called kushi in Japanese, um, you're probably going to remember next time you look at a menu or, you know, um, at a restaurant or something. And the character for, for, uh, food on a skewer is this. I thought that was so cool. So, um, you know, hopefully something like this, making this kind of visual comparison will kind of be cemented into your long-term memory now um, because it's just much more powerful for pictures to be stored away in your brain than it is for obviously large paragraphs of text. 
So um, I thought this was really cool. So hopefully you remember this when you use the skewer emoji on your phone. Um, and you can see, you know, obviously even with different fonts, um, that content still comes through. And this is something that we like to translate to, you know, biology as a visual language is, can we kind of agree upon some sort of standardized visual language so that a T cell always looks like a T cell, but, you know, give it a little bit of a flair. So maybe it's got its own font or style based on the, the you know, appropriate scenario. So anyway, that's a little bit of a um, tangent there, but. Here's another example, um, more applied to sciences, and especially if you're talking to a broader audience of why it's important to use relatable figures. Um, I was giving this presentation to a more general public, and the comment was, you know, why, like, what is this even describing? Why do I have cells in my body? Does, do, does having cells mean that I have a disease? So sometimes you have to boil it down to really the bare basics. Um, and sometimes pictures like this that are again relatable, it's you know kind of in pop culture, is a much more uh, kind of visually appealing way and memorable way to describe something. So try to use you know household items, um, photographs, uh, concepts that are in pop culture, things like that, um, that to really kind of resonate with your audience. Even if it's a highly technical audience, you'll be surprised about how appreciative people can be when you can boil things down to really simple terms. Um, and simple terms, by that I mean, you know, simple pictures. Great, okay. And we're just breezing through these, so hopefully you're still following along. Um, the takeaway here is to use relatable visuals and to tie them sort of, you know, concepts to words. But one thing I can say with confidence is to never use pictures as backgrounds. Um, it, rarely works. Um, even if you have, you know, five, 10 years of design experience, you might be able to pull this off. And there might be rare cases where you, you actually need to put a picture for a background. But almost 90% of the time, 99% of the time, um, I, I would definitely avoid this. So it's, it's quite difficult to do and just very distracting. So definitely avoid this kind of a uh, you know, visual. And we see this quite often. Um, more often than not. Okay, so let's see here. We've got any other unanswered questions in the chat box? Looks like we're okay. Uh, all right, quite a few questions. And I'm so sorry if I don't get to your questions. Um, we actually had 3,000 registrants for this webinar. So the questions are pouring in and I love them. They're all really, really relevant, good questions. So if I'm not able to answer them now, I will go back and answer them, perhaps collate them and send them out as an email. So definitely have, you know, feel free to keep asking them here, even if we don't get to them right away. Um, I do see one right away here, which is, what is your preferred software for slide making? I have recently preferred uh, Google Slides more than PowerPoint. Um, it's kind of a pick your poison, but, Slides has just been easier to collaborate with colleagues, especially um, you know working from home. Uh, tip number three, um, and we've only got five here to cover. So the third one is to avoid low contrast images. This is probably the number one mistake we see across presentations, grant figures, publication images, posters, um, you name it. It's really hard to do well, and it's very difficult to um, you know, test for. And we've come up with a couple of solutions here for that. Um, the first thing is just to really understand what color value is. And if you've attended our other sort of 101 webinars in the past, we talk about this a lot because we're very passionate about people knowing about this. So the a concept of color value is actually just the lightness or darkness of the color. So the left panel here is probably a little bit difficult to, you know, stay looking at. It looks like one of those, um, 3D books you had in the 90s where you'd have to like stare at it for a long time and see if it like popped up an image. Um, and that's because it's really hard to focus on something that has very similar um, darkness or lightness. So basically what that means is the colors are deceiving um, and the green and the orange here, if you can see color, it's actually very similar in color value. So what you're probably seeing is the is the bottom row is, is actually the same as the top row. If you turn it to black and white. And there are many reasons why this, was, this is an issue. Of course, colorblindness comes into play. Um, 
And, you know, one in 12 men are colorblind in the world. I think it's one in 200 women. So quite a large population of people. Um, so the rule of thumb is really don't stack parts of an image that are close in color value. Uh, you can see here, if I were to turn these two blocks into black and white again, it actually disappears. So this is an issue if you're submitting to a journal and, and you know, the editor will print it out. And even nowadays, we'll probably sit on their couch and kind of review your paper. You've lost the audience already if you know, the images are too close in color value. And rule of thumb again here, don't stack images that are on the same horizontal row, I guess in this case, looking at my color palette. You should actually go this way and try to stack dark on light and light on dark. And here's an example in, I guess, in real life or scientific illustration life. Um, you know, dark cytosol sometimes is a common thing where you want to layer stuff on top of a cell. Sometimes the nuclei, which is usually pretty dark, you layer DNA on top and that disappears too. One of the most common mistakes we see. So again, if you change it to black and white, you see that almost completely um, eliminates the glucose molecules and the font. And of course, if we fix that, immediately more visible. So sometimes you don't really need a color for the cytosol. I would even avoid it sometimes. But if you do want to add a slight hue, you can do that. But just be careful again using dark colored backgrounds. Here it is in action. And sorry, it's a little bit blurry there. But again, really common to see um, when you're labeling things like cells. Cells, obviously, you know, nuclei stain darker. So sometimes in our schematics, we end up using these iconographies that have dark nuclei. Um, but yeah, just be sure that you're using dark on light, light on dark, and it's visible enough that, uh, you know, you can see the foreground elements. Sometimes that even means knocking back the background opacity of an object, and that's totally allowed. That doesn't break any rules. You know, it, it's not really necessary to have a, such a strong background like that. So what I do is I just took the opacity and sl um, slid it down so that it was a little less stark. I hope that makes sense. Oh, and then we also um, put it in grayscale. So there's actually a grayscale mode in BioRender, but I'm sure other software has this too. If you preview in grayscale, it'll actually give you a really nice quick gut check to see if, yeah, do, do all my elements have enough contrast? If not, let's go back in and, you know, change the color and boost that contrast. Okay. Um, and then another thing is, I would definitely avoid this look from the 90s. Um, and yeah, I do see this sometimes, uh, the sort of bright yellow heading colors and the, um, the gradient backgrounds. I would definitely try to avoid this. Sometimes we call this colloquial as the Save by the Bell color palette. Um, I think just because I was born in the 80s that this kind of resonates with me. Um, but yeah, I would definitely avoid it. Similar to how you use pictures as a background, very hard to do. Gradients are also really hard to do well. And so yeah, definitely try to avoid using that. In fact, if you Google bad PowerPoint designs, this is actually, well, at least this is what Google fed to me, um, is the majority of figures are usually, um, you know, made on a colored background, a, a gradient background, or a photograph as a background. So definitely try to avoid that. I'm sure a lot of you do not fall into this camp, but, you know, you might slip into that. So just be careful about, uh, make sure it's, you know, as, sol as, as solid a color as possible for your background image or background color. and um, as stark a contrast as possible for the foreground elements like text. And the question was, does Byron have a grayscale button? And yes, it does. It's in the, I think it's the preview drop down. Okay. So tip number four, um, I get to ask this a lot as well is, you know, for PowerPoint slides or for Google slides, um, should I use a dark background or a light background? And it really depends on the situation. Um, of course, using a dark background is a little bit trickier because if you throw in your you know, analysis and your charts and your graphs, those are gonna have sort of a white halo around it. And some might not, so then it's gonna look a little bit disjointed. But if you can, and if you have the time to kind of you know, go through and fix things, I would recommend using a dark background. Uh, for example, this image that I'm using now, the design, it's a lot softer on the eye when it's a dark background like this or a colored 
you know, darker blue with white text, it really centers your attention to the middle. Um, and this is especially true for different room types. So if you're in a small room, for example, or a big room, the situation will change, um, you know, related to the kinds of background color you want to use. So large rooms, you don't want to burn everyone's retina who's sitting in the audience. So darker backgrounds are better for that. For smaller rooms that are, you know, just kind of like a huddle or a lab meeting with the lights on, white background is totally fine. And again, much easier and faster if you've got PNG and JPEG mixes on your slide deck. If you are going to go with the dark background, however, um, I would recommend, again, making sure that all of your logos and your pictures are sort of the white PNG version or the PNG version in general. Um, so, for example, here I picked two logos that have the white version, but of course the reverse is all, also available on Google. So you just got to do a little bit of searching as far as finding the right figures to suit dark backgrounds. Uh, if you do fall into the trap of something like this, where you're trying to show a bunch of things, and again, some have that white halo effect, and some have that PNG, PNG look. So PNGs is a, is a file format, if you don't know. Um, uh, it is basically a picture without that white background. And then JPEGs, and some PNGs actually, do have a white background. So just to know the difference between those two and why they're so important. Um, <laughs> I see some funny comments there. Um, so yeah, if there is a trick here, sometimes what I'll do is if I have an image like this, I'll just literally put a square behind all the things that have um, kind of that, that weird uh, mix of white and non-white backgrounds. And then have this nice dark band along the top to show kind of the subheader header or subtitle. That's a quick trick to do. Just because you start with a dark background doesn't mean you have to stick with that for every single slide. This is a nice way to kind of quote unquote cheat and use you know an overall dark background for your entire presentation and then sometimes sprinkle in the sort of mix of dark and white backgrounds. Hope that makes sense. Um, and that's sort of the resulting image. Okay, we're kind of flying through these, so hopefully I haven't lost any of you. Um, got a couple more chats here. Looks like everyone's still still on the line. We've got quite a few. If you're curious and it doesn't show, we've got about fifteen hundred participants right now. So that's really exciting. Hopefully you're getting uh, some value out of this. Uh, tip number five. And um, that is to try simple animation. So I know uh, a lot of you um, filled out the sort of pre-survey when you signed up for the Zoom webinar and requested, you know, how do we do animation? Can you do animation in BioRender yet? Um, the answer is not yet, but we are working towards it. And, you know, I do recommend trying animation, very simple animation, but using it sparingly. Um, when you have too many GIFs and too many things flying around, you one risk the animations not playing, which you know can kind of make or break your presentation. Um, and then two, it just being too distracting. So again, I would definitely pick your moments when you really want it to shine. Um, one way I think that animation definitely helps is when you want to show kind of sequential order of stories like pathways. And I showed this in our recent Twitter takeover on I am Sidecom. So if you saw it there, it looked familiar. But basically what I do is I take a finished picture and then I actually work backwards by removing each step that I want to show up in each successive uh, slide. So I actually go backwards. I finish the figure and then I take away or subtract each step that I want to show up in that step. And that actually is a really nice way to ensure that things don't jump around if I go to present you know, during a presentation, for example. And then I'll have sort of a stack of, say, maybe five slides that look the same, and then I'll advance them using the uh, slide transition as an animation instead of the native animation within PowerPoint. Uh, if you're brave enough, I would continue that, but I just prefer the using each slide as a transition. Um, it doesn't really print well if you are putting together lecture material. So obviously have a printer friendly version. Um, I did have professors back in the day that had, you know, 300, power, 300 slide PowerPoints because each slide was a 
step in an animation. So I would recommend having, you know, printer friendly or study friendly versions. And there's a couple of softwares that we use. Um, of course, as professionals, we like to use, uh, you know, Adobe After Effects and uh, Adobe Premiere and sort of the more advanced, robust animation softwares. But if you want to try doing a really quick screen grab and then turning that into a GIF, um, you can try some of these softwares. I know QuickTime is free, it's a little bit limiting in editability. Um, and then I actually just use these sort of online free open source things like EasyGIF or GIFSKI that converts videos to GIFs. The nice thing about GIFs as well, or, or GIFs or GIFs, G I F, file format, if you don't already know, it will actually autoplay in your presentation. So if I go back here, I'm not touching anything. It's just kind of playing and looping on its own. And nothing's worse than if you have a video and you're ready to show your kind of, you know, climax of your story and then it doesn't play. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll have the GIF version and the video version ready to go for a presentation. So at least you'll know that the GIF will autoplay without any interruption um, or involvement. And uh, that's a really nice kind of, you know, hack if you're worried about a video not playing. Great, okay, so I think that was a really, really quick breeze through of five quick tips. I probably have a hundred here that I wanted to go through, but for the interest of time, I just picked five for now. I will get to probably all of them hopefully and then record them and post them onto YouTube. So definitely look out for that. We didn't cover fonts um, or, or margins or you know, anything related to other formats like posters or grants or journal figures, which we have a lot of content about and I'm excited to share uh, in next week's webinar. But I thought we'd switch gears a little bit. Um, let's see here, since this is a visual webinar, um, I thought we'd switch gears and switch over to BioRender and show you kind of a quick sort of figure makeover. Um, Exit full screen, and hopefully you can see my screen still. So for the next, uh, I guess, 15 minutes, I'm going to pick a couple of figures, and then um, hopefully it'll be helpful to see how you know a medical illustrator would think through fixing a figure. Um, and hopefully you can see my screen. It should be fire render kind of demo account. And actually, you know what, I'm gonna sign up just to show you how easy it is to sign in. So this is our website. If you've seen it before, it just shows you know, what we're about. It navigates you to the sign-in page if you kind of forgot to bookmark that. And um, this is the sign-in page. So a little bit different. All it is is just to get you to sign in with your email and password. So it's a different sort of website. It's just app.firerunner.com. Um, Yes, sign out for a second here. Sign in. There we go. So you can see the breadth of the types of figures that I'm able to make in BioRender. And again, many of you have used BioRender many times. This will be your repeat. But hopefully, for the new um, BioRenderers, you'll get a little taste of what um, BioRender is about. Um, I'll just kind of make a really quick figure here. And since we're talking about presentations, I'll use our default slide uh, layout, create my figure. And actually nowadays it's a little bit more of a 16 by nine um, ratio. So I'm gonna go 16 and then nine. There we go. So it's a bit of a wider format. So you can see you can kind of edit this canvas, of course, as you see fit. Um, and then let's see, I can actually apply a template if I don't want to start from scratch here. So say it's a, you know, some sort of experimental protocol that I'm doing from, you know, A to B, something like this. I'm going to add to my illustration. And this is just a shortcut. I would usually do this by from scratch to show you all the functionality, but just to show you how easy it is to make a figure in BioRender, it just 
preloaded everything I needed from one to 10. Maybe I'm not talking about the brain, maybe it's something related to, um, let's see, lungs. And I wanted to grab maybe a sample. This is uh, mouse lungs. And to better show, you know, kind of zooming into this area, maybe I'll use a curved arrow. And I love the biorender arrows because they're kind of bendy and animated. And I'm going to line fade, which means it's going to make it look like it's, you know, zooming out of that area. See how it kind of created that cool gradient. So little things like that that really add to your story. And for a PowerPoint slide, maybe I would have. Um, you know, maybe sequentially shown these as I kind of go through my lecture or my presentation. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, um, and then save them as, you know, steps. I want to show a bunch of cells here. So kind of put into perspective. Change the colors, and I'll bring this arrow to the front. So really easy to go through and kind of modify. Is if this is the wrong machine, maybe I'll type in mass spec, and you'll see a whole bunch of really beautifully rendered machines. I'm not sure if this is even the right one, but I'm going to put it in here for demonstration purposes. Um, and then you know these are all editable as far as color combos are concerned. So definitely try it out. You can probably imagine, you know, your imagination can go pretty wild with what kind of um, types of figures you can make in BioRender. But I just wanted to highlight that it should be, you know, very clear, very clearly labeled, um, particularly for presentation. So, you know, clearly show one, two, three, four, five, or A, B, C, D, E. Um, sometimes if you don't have these numbers, it can be quite disorienting because you don't really know, see if I remove that. Um, I don't really know where to start and end, um, you know, sort of the, how to scan the picture. So adding that back in is going to really create that sequential movement of your eye. And I'm seeing some pictures here, uh, some uh, questions here I'll try to get to. Um, let's see, I, I saw somewhere, how, how do you pick fonts? Um, within Byron, we've actually selected a nice kind of short list of fonts that we like that work really well across many different types of use cases. So Helvetica is a sans serif font that we love. So Roboto is a really nice average of Helvetica and Arial. Um, and then a few others, of course, these are sometimes used for um, DNA labeling and Calibri as well. But I would definitely recommend using the sans serif font, which is the non-decorated version, when you're labeling images versus the serif font, which are labels like this. It's a little bit fancier. I would definitely stick with the sans serif to see the difference. Okay, so that's a picture, um, you know, made from a template in Byrender. And if you want, again want to follow the sort of grid line rules. I would actually go in and create grid lines to make sure that you're following a good spacing habit between your pictures. Also that they're all kind of, you know, lined up in a way. So I'm seeing here that my labels aren't really lined up. And this might look a little, you know, kind of crazy to want to go in and fix all of these little pixel perfect uh, points, but sometimes it really does take your image from you know, 80% looking to, to 95 or even 100. So really makes a difference. Kind of group it together and align whenever you can. These little things are really gonna just help tell your story better. There we go. And if I were to preview that, that looks pretty nice. I'm gonna go ahead and export. And this was the difference I was telling you about for PNG versus JPEG pictures. The PNG with transparent background actually allows you to um, export figures without a background. So you could clip these out and you know, move them around in PowerPoint if you liked later, and it won't have a background color to it, which is nice. Um, so let me go ahead and show you what that looks like. Export. 
And I'll just throw it onto my desktop for now. And if I go back to my slide deck here and I hit insert, um, you'll see that it actually imports without that background. So it looks really weird because I've got a blue background here. So always, you know, kind of know the final use case for your pictures. But it's kind of cool to know that, you know, it'll actually knock that background out if you need. So I'm going to change my background to white. And so it looks really crisp and clear. And again, maybe if you wanted to show stepwise in an animation, you could actually advance the slides and show each step. Oops. Cool. So that was that. Um, I want to go back now and spend a couple of minutes to go through um, an example that was submitted by uh, a volunteer here. Um, let's see, a couple of questions, how to add grid lines. I think I went through that. So you can just look up grid lines in Byrunder and it will definitely show up for you. Um, can you import images from an outside source? Yes, you can. So I'll just really quickly show you how to do that. You can actually upload a file using the upload tab. And so you can actually import pictures, um, you know, histology images, something like this maybe. Obviously not a vector picture, but something that you can include. Charts, graphs, and you can actually import um, an SVG image. So if that's important to you, you can actually do that as well. Of course, you can crop. You can basically do all the things you can, you know, you would suspect to be able to do in uh, an illustration software. Kind of like a one-stop shop. Oh, one thing that's really cool, I might as well just show you now, is their PDB plugin. So if you do work with um, the Protein Data Bank, this is a really cool plugin that shows um, crystallized structures, but you can actually paint it in different colors. So um, our artists work with our developers to pick a really nice palette of colors for you to select from. Um, and so I don't know if it's robust enough for the structural biologists out there, but if you just wanted to add like a really beautiful 3D kind of uh, render of a molecule, you can actually do that using our plugin here. And these are all available on the free version of BioRender, by the way, so definitely feel free to check it out. There we go. Oh, sorry, added. Great. So yeah, if you didn't like these more two and a half D looking proteins, you can actually add in your own. Cool. So going back to my gallery here. Um, yeah, the question is at the end, do you save as a JPEG and import to PowerPoint? Yes, exactly. Or a PDF. You can actually export as a PDF, JPEG, or PNG. Great. So for the last few minutes here, I wanted to take um, this figure that was submitted. I thought it was really cool. Um, and, you know, just a couple of quick tips and we could have taken this to, you know, 95, 90 to 100. Um, and Brigitte, I think if you had that information on the original author of this, um, maybe you could throw that into the chat. I apologize, I don't have it labeled here. And thank you for whoever submitted this. So uh, really nice job of showing, um, you know, this zoom in call out. You probably use this a lot where you want to zoom into a part of your figure by using kind of one of these circle crop things, which is great. I definitely encourage you to use this. Um, what I would probably do is put a circle around that though. Just again, the idea of contrast is really important to be able to differentiate, um, you know, your images from each other. I'm just take a quick screenshot and throw that in here. There we go. And head back here. And so a couple of things that I would do is maybe add a border to this, maybe a dark border, remove the fill, and then so you can already see that it's sort of compartmentalized. And that's sort of the idea of when you're creating figures is to try to compartmentalize parts of your story as much as possible. Again, you kind of want to just make sure that they really, really know what parts of your story you want them to look at and don't leave anything to the imagination. Let's see. 
Uh, and a few things I would recommend is to try to break, um, break edges. And what that means is see how this label is lined up exactly with one of these cells, these photoreceptor cells. Um, what I would actually do is I would encourage you to bend the line so that it's not parallel to anything else. Perhaps like this and then label it there. Um, in this case, maybe we can do something like this. You've probably seen anatomy books where they do that. They kind of give it a little bit of an elbow. But that way, you know, you're not mistaken. You're not mistaking the cell shape with uh, the label. This is pretty nice how they've created sort of a square bracket here to show that this area is probably the area of damage or the area of concentration. I'll probably just add another line here. We're actually gonna be implementing square brackets, so you won't have to do this manually, but um, definitely a good idea to have that sort of square bracket. Uh, same thing happening down here where you probably didn't even see this label line. This happens a lot, where this label line is kind of just you know, perfectly aligning with this sort of, um, um, you know, basement membrane here. So again, I would just try to break that line and also try to get everything parallel. So let's just do a little bit of house cleaning here of the labels. So this is the choroid. Maybe I'll do something like this, get this out of the way. This is the membrane that they were trying to label as well. So I'm going to bend the elbow to be like so. Um, choroid neurovasculature, let's make that maybe left aligned, decrease the spacing. And then when you've got the elbows out like this, you can actually do a lot by moving them around. You get really flexible. Um, choroid neurovasculature, okay, this one's a little tricky, so maybe we can actually switch places. Sometimes it takes a little bit of finagling here to make sure you get it right. There we go. So that's a little bit more comfortable to read. And I'm going to break this elbow like this again so we can actually get those lines parallel. But you can see that like, you know, even doing this has dramatically increased the, the legibility of your figure. And, you know, not just for presentations, but for, um, you know, for, for publications, for grants, uh, it's really important. Legibility is going to be the, the main important factor. And we can actually afford to make this come out a little bit more here. So much clearer. And as parallel as possible. I hope I got those labels right. I'm sorry if I've mixed them up a little bit. Um, and then obviously space out the, you know, labels as much as possible. But see how we've kind of broken, we were no longer parallel to the objects in which it's labeling. So automatically it's much cleaner, much more visible. Um, and I'd probably, you know, do the same thing here with this label. Uh, one thing is also the contrast. So let's go ahead and check our contrast values here by previewing grayscale. Um, and it's looking okay, actually, not too bad. Not a whole ton of uh, lost information, so that's good. Um, this bottom area is getting a little bit dark, so if I squint, those label lines are getting a little bit lost in the choroid. So why don't I go ahead and drop the opacity a little bit. That's a little better, and if I leave grayscale mode, now I've got, we're running into the issue of these guys getting a little bit light. So we can actually then make those, bump those up and make those darker. So there's a lot you can do here by playing with the darkness and lightness. I think we have select all same icon in Biorender. So you can actually select multiple icons that are the same and then make them darker. Right. 
All right, so you can see that even just changing the way I've labeled these things has made a big difference. And if I compare now sort of the before and after, and this is kind of how I learned to design as well. I just kind of watched um, you know, other people and see how they resolved their issues. Um, and then kind of was able to implement those myself when I didn't, when it came time for me to draw. Let's kind of screenshot that. Bring it back here. All right, so if I were to toggle between the before and afters, very, very subtle difference. But you can see here, okay, well, this isn't fair because I've, <laughs> I've moved the inset on top of the labels. But, you know, it's actually mixing up with the background, even if that was out of the way. So that's the before, and that's the after. But just moving the labels and breaking that sort of uh, parallel line has made the labeling much, much clearer. And labeling is sometimes the most difficult part of finishing an image because that's where, you know, a lot of the descriptions are going to happen since you don't have room for descriptions um, on a slide. Great. Okay, so thank you for the brave person that had submitted that for, uh, for a makeover. I really appreciate that. We'll actually send you the finished version here if it is of use to you. Um, and then you can use it for, for whatever purposes you need it. Um, and we are accepting figures like this if you'd like us to kind of give a little bit of a um, you know, touch up or, um, you know, a bit of a design, design help for it. Happy to do so. Um, all right. So we're just at about three o'clock, sadly, that one hour flew by really quickly. Um, so just to recap, the tips that we covered were to try to use breadcrumbs and padding, you know, so to kind of lead your audience's story as much as possible. And oops. Um, tip number two is obviously be memorable um, with relatable images. Tip three was to avoid low contrast images, you know, to understand color value. And tip four was to use dark or light backgrounds, depending on the situation. And then tip five was to use animation sparingly, um, but to try it out and to try to try GIFs instead of MP4s or .MOVs in case they don't play for your presentation. Okay. So I'll stop there for now. Um, I will stick around for a couple of minutes and try to answer some of these questions. I really appreciate everyone's participation. We were not expecting this volume of participants. Um, thank you so much for your attention. I hope that was fun. We hope to run more of these where we'll try to get out more tips and tricks. Um, if you do want to join for future ones, here's our rough schedule. We've got another one coming up next Thursday. And um, this will focus solely on how to make better grant figures. Grant figures are a little strange because they're really small. You have to cram a bunch of information into one area. So we're going to talk about uh, space saving tips, which is uh, really helpful for grant tip figures, maybe specific names pages that you're working on. Um, and also the following Thursday, we're going to be covering tips on how to make better posters. This is kind of a beast of a topic and we'll break it down into again, both the entire design as well as the individual figures within that poster. Um, following that, we'll be scheduling um, webinars for making better journal figures, um, and then if you've got other ideas on the types of uh, figures you want us to cover, I know that some popular ideas were, you know, science communication for the public, maybe for talking to a lay audience. So we'd be happy to cover topics like that. But yeah, we're not really going anywhere. And um, hopefully you're all still hunkering down at home as well. So we've got lots to share and definitely look out for an email from us. Um, if you don't already have a BioRender account, you can certainly sign up for a free one at www.biorender.com. Um, you can also go to barner.com slash newsletter, and um, that should bring up our newsletter portal if you want to just sign up for the newsletter and not for Barrender. Again, these are all free services, so I'd encourage you to sign up anyway, just in case. Um, let's see here, slash newsletter. That should come up. Here we go. So yeah, just throw in your email there. 
Um, even if you sign up and then check, you know, subscribe me to the newsletter to get, um, you know, notifications on when webinars are launching. Um, we won't email you twice. We'll just kind of, I think, remove the, the duplicated email. So just in case you can sign up for our newsletter there as well. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, everybody, for your attention. Um, there's so many people still on the line, so I really appreciate you sticking with me till the very last time here. And as I mentioned, we are going to um, have this recording. It looks like some of you are, are signing in now. I'm sorry, yeah, you did miss the, the, the webinar, but we are going to um, export it as um, you know, a movie file and then upload it to likely YouTube. So we'll send out the link to your email. So just uh, look up for the email that you signed up for this news, news uh, webinar with and um, it'll show up there. Cool, thank you again so much everybody for joining. And um, yeah, feel free to share with your colleagues or friends if you think they'd also be interested to sign up for our next webinars. And I look forward to seeing you then. All right, bye-bye everybody. I promise I'd show my face at the end. <laughs>